So we're glad to share with you today the word. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I have shared with you a couple of questions about faith, and I'm going to stay on that subject this morning. So I gave you three questions a couple of weeks ago. How do I get faith? What is it for? And what do I do with it? I'm not going to go over a lot of that. I'm just going to tell you what they were, and you can, you, you can look at that uh, uh, tape or CD or whatever you, however you put it online. Huh? Get, get up to the right date in the century, amen? Uh, so we want to just talk about that just for a second. So how do I get faith? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. And hearing produces the faith that you and I need for every day and for the situations of our life. And what's faith for? We, we said in Matthew 17, 20, we called it actually a mountain-moving faith. It's just a seed. And today you got a little, I hope you got a little card here today. Did anybody get, immediately not get one of these? And it's this, uh, this is all the faith it takes. It got a little dot on it. I was going to have uh, Esther make these up and put a seed on it, but I, as I opened the can up, they rolled all over the place. <laughs> so it's better to put a dot, and it's just about the same thing anyway, Okay. Uh, but I want you to take this home, and you can put it on your refrigerator, put it in your Bible, whatever it is. And I want you to remember, this is all the faith it takes to whatever God's called you to do. Amen. Okay, so that'll be part of what we're going we're gonna to minister about this morning. Anyway, and we talked about what it is. So today we're going to talk about uh, the seed, fair, or, excuse me, we're going to talk about what do I do with it. And I think it's important that you and I know that God gave you something that you didn't earn, you didn't deserve. He gave you a gift of faith. We found that in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. But and when, Let's go to that scripture this morning, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. So here it is. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So Christ is living in you, through you. And I, the life I live now, I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God for the righteous came by law and not by, I'm in the wrong scripture. Let me see. No, that's Ephesians. Put in Ephesians. I gave you the wrong scripture. Ephesians 2.20. I knew that didn't sound right when I, thank you. Uh, and, and are built upon the foundation of the Apostle Paul, Jesus Christ, the Greek cornerstone. Verse 21. Nope, that's not the right scripture either. Wow. Okay, let me open my Bible. I write notes and sometimes I don't finish it. So let me go because there's a thought here that I want to give you. What is it? Thank you very much. Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. That was the one I wanted. Let's go to 8. Verse 8. Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9 and 10. Thank you. For by grace am I saved through faith, and that not of myself yourself. It is a gift of God. So wait a minute. Let me just say something. We're not saved by anything we've done. We're saved by the faith of God. Amen. God believed in the salvation of Jesus Christ, what the price that he paid for you and I. So he gave you that when we asked him for salvation. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of things that I've done. I'm not saved because of that. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God created you unto good works, Amen. unto good things. Created you for a purpose. He's working in your life for a purpose that is beyond our ability. I could never be a good man. I could never be a good husband. I could never be a good worker. I was never a good welder until Jesus Christ came into my life. And then I became a good man. Then I became a good husband. Then I became a good father. Then I was called into the pastor. All those things are based on Jesus Christ working in my life for his will. I hope that you have seen in your life things change because Jesus Christ is working in you. 
I'm not developing myself. I'm being developed by God. That's the most important thing. Put the last scripture back up. Verse 10, I believe it is. I am his workmanship created in Christ unto good works, which God had before ordained that I should walk in them. God had a plan for your life and my life before we were ever born. Before the foundation of the world. I didn't realize salvation came before the foundation of the world, but he also had a plan for your life. God thought about you thousands of years before anything actually took place. Thousands of years he planned for this day. I know there's been billions of people before us. There'll be people after us, however long that is until Jesus comes. But he has something for you that's unique only to you and for you. We may look at ourselves and say, I've made mistakes. Right, but God is still chiseling away in your life and building what he needs in you that you can be the best that he wants you to be. Amen. And then what happens is our conscience comes in and say, God, I don't want to disappoint you. I want to be everything you want me to be. So I live a new life. You know, we talk about everything that becomes new. I live a new life. It's a do-over. Everybody wants a do-over sometimes. We want to take a test over. We want something else to happen. But God has given us a do-over. Do go, go to 2 Corinthians 5.17, part of our foundational scripture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if we become saved, if we give our life to Christ, if any man or woman be in Christ, be saved, he's a new creature. Amen. One scripture says a new creation. When God took the world and started forming everything, it was that without form, it was void, and, and, and God spoke to it, let there be light, and uh, everything changed. God is making everything change in your life and my life. Light came in, the light and life of God came into my life. Old things are passed away. Aren't you glad old things are passed? But how many know sometimes we still are affected by old things? We're affected by old people. And I'm not saying just, I'm talking about age. So don't look at me that way and say, you're affecting me, Pastor. <laughs> I hope I am, but I, in, in a good way. Anyway, we turn around, we have, we have, we're affected by old things. Uh, you put this scripture back up. Don't take that down. <laughs> Thank you. Are passed away. They died. Behold, all things are become new. When the word behold is in the scriptures in the King James, it means stop and look. Do you ever stop and look in the mirror? Now, we do that because we want to make ourselves pretty or whatever. But you also have to see, I'm not the same as I was. I found an old photo of me the other day. It wasn't that old, but it was older than a while. And I had uh, brown hair and I had a brown mustache. And I said, wow, what happened? You know, things change. Things are always changing. And I guess this is for the better. We'll, we'll find out in the time. But it, it's what's happening in me today. And that's okay. I'm still living a life. My life is in Christ. I, wanna, I got to do over. If you could do some things over, in or about your life, what would you do differently? You need to answer that question in yourself. What would you do differently? And I'll ask you this question. Why haven't you? Why haven't you done it differently? God has given you a new beginning. God has given you things that, that will help you to change. When we named this church, I, I was in prayer asking God, what do you want to name the church? He said, I want you to name it New Beginnings, plural. Because, Paul, I'm, as I've given you a new beginning every day, that's the message that you give to everybody. God wants you to have a new beginning. He doesn't want you to live in the failures of yesterday or even the victories of yesterday. He has something new for you today. So it's a new beginning. And God's given us a new beginning every day. The Bible says his mercy is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So God's got new things for you. Let me start with a, just a basic foundation. I don't remember if I put this scripture on, on the list. But it's John 3.3 3 says we need to be born again. Jesus told that to Nicodemus. We need to be born again. Then he said you need to be born in verse 5. You need to be born of the water and of the spirit. 
the infilling of the Holy Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. You need to be born again just to see the kingdom. And then you need to be born in water and spirit in order to enter the kingdom. So there's a process that we do. We, our child is born, but then he has to grow. And we have to teach him how to do certain things. And all of a sudden, he's, he's beginning to take over walk. And we want to enter the kingdom. In verse 20, if you go back to, well, maybe it's not 20. Let me see. I, I think I made a mistake in that scripture. Let me see. Yes, now let me go back to verse 20 in Galatians chapter 2. This is what I want to say. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. God believes in you. Can I tell you that? That God believes in you. Turn to somebody and say, God believes in you. No, no, come on, mean it. God believes in you. He believes that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. I realize that's the scripture of Christ, but it's also that he's given to you. He believes that you can do what he asks you to do, what he's calling you to do, what he's developing you to do. He believes in you, and therefore he's given you something. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. How much faith do you think Jesus has? He believes in you. He loves you. He has a hope in you. He has an eternal hope in your life. The things that work out. Who loved me and he gave himself for me. His faith, his love is now in your life and my life. That's what he did through the cross, through the death, burial, and the resurrection. He's given it to you and to me. Paul writes in one scripture, he gave himself for me. Jesus believes in me, and so Jesus loves me. How much does he love you? He gave his life for you. He gave eternity for you. He, he gave up everything in heaven to come here to be a man, to die for you, to suffer for, for, for your place, in your place, to become what you need. He wants you in heaven. In verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. I do not want to frustrate God. So what's God's grace? God's grace is this, the power to live a new life in him. So we always talk about grace and mercy. So let me give you a definition, just a simple, I'm not going to go into biblical, theological definition. I'm going to give you a simple definition. Grace is the power to live the new life. Mercy is for your forgiveness. He forgave you. His blood, the power of the blood has forgiven you your sins. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The moment I asked Jesus to come in my life, everything changed. I couldn't tell you how, it just did. I want you to realize there has to be a day that you accepted Christ in your life and things changed that moment. Someone, I was talking to somebody one day, I said, do you remember the day you were saved? He said, no. I said, what? You, never, you don't remember the day you were born again? No. I said, find a day that you were born again. I was born again April 11th, 1976. That was my, I remember my birthday, January 10th. I'm not telling you what year. <laughs> but I remember the day that I was born again. Things changed in my life. I, 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 God renewed my life with my family. All that kind of stuff happened in a moment of time because I asked Jesus to come into my life. I didn't know what I was asking for. But God gave me heaven. God gave me salvation. 
He gave me something I couldn't imagine, but it was in his mind, his heart, those days that he was suffering on, on the, that day he suffered on the cross through the death, burial, and resurrection. His plan began to really unfold, began to become clear. All of it was hidden before the New Testament and before his death. Righteousness does not come by the law. Doing right doesn't make you righteous because we can't keep the law. There's 613 laws in the scriptures that you as a person should keep if you're a Jew. 613. I talked to a Jew one day. He said, I cannot live by the laws. That's why the Bible says the law was weak because it was toward man. Now it became strong because it was in Christ. He's covered us. And that's why we can keep coming back to him when we fail. But God doesn't want you to fail every day. He wants you to realize, no, I got more for you today than yesterday. He wants you to come to that place of living that life in victory. So he gives us all things pertaining to life and holiness. Let me say something. We speak of the word holiness and we think of the, the, the restrictionness of God. I want you to think of holiness as something that God gave you that separates you from the world. You ever have anybody tell you when you, you, you became a Christian, you said, well, you think you're holier than now? You're better than me? Why do they say that? Jealousy. Right, right, jealousy, because they realize there's a difference in your life. And you're not trying to brag about it. You're just saying, God saved me. He forgave me. I'm different. And, you know, I don't do these things I used to do with you and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm, I'm not looking at this. I'm not talking about that. I, I, it, my life is different. The guys I worked with at the, at the shop where I worked at for 38 years, they saw a difference. Not that I wanted to have that difference, but it became clear that Paul's different. I talked to a man one day. His name is Bob. Outside my welding area, he was assembling machines. I just went over and said hi to him. And he said, Paul, you're different. And I said, really? Because I'm still in welding clothes and whatever. And he said, no, you're different. He said, we've been watching you. And it really went, what? We've been watching you. You're different. You don't cuss. You don't smoke. You don't do the things. You don't, a lot of things you don't do anymore. You're just, you're different. And I went back into my welding area and closed the door. I had a door that I could actually lock, and, and I just cried on the Lord. I said, God, thank you for making me different, but why? Because, because of him. Mm -hmm. He wants you and I to live a different life and have a different life. And then that, that life, listen to me, it's not the words you say, it's the way you live that proves something's different. But if you're not living differently, then I, don't, I wonder if anything really happened between you and Christ. There has to be some, all of a sudden, my friends don't want to hang around with me. And I didn't want to hang around with them. Because we lost the common good, supposedly, the common things we had. We lost them. Thank God. Thank God. Sister Ann said the other day, uh, I don't know if it was in her testimony here, or maybe something she's writing for... Uh, she's doing out the rock today. She said she still has people that call her today, 40 years after she's been saved. Are you still with Christ? You still a Christian? Yes, I am. Click. Because they don't want you if you got Jesus. They don't want you if you got Jesus. Why? Because it brings conviction to them life. And to, a, to, a, to somebody who's not saved, it brings condemnation. God doesn't want to condemn anybody. He wants to convict them of their sin. That brings the change. When you and I make mistakes, do you feel a little of the Holy Spirit? You probably shouldn't do that, Paul. That's not right for you to think that. Not right for you to go there. That's conviction to do what? Change us. Move us in a right way. That's the faith that God has given to us to live now. I want to share with you a couple of thoughts that God gave me uh, the other day when I was writing this out, and it was really kind of, kind of odd. And I'm going to actually use this in in a few some future messages. But let me ask you a, a question. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. I don't think I gave this to her, but let's go to Matthew chapter 15, and I think it's verse 28. 
after making mistakes on some of the other ones, I wonder if I was right. So give me a second. There's a woman that came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, uh, and she came to Jesus to worship him, to, to get her, him to heal her daughter who was demon-possessed. And the Bible goes on to say that, excuse me, the Bible goes on to say that the disciples asked Jesus, asked Jesus to get rid of her. They weren't doing anything. They couldn't help her, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he, he said to the woman, you know, I can't give you the, listen to what this scripture says. I can't give the bread of the children of Israel to the dogs. And she said, but the puppies live under the table of the children and they eat the crumbs. Listen to what it says in verse 28. And Jesus answered her and said, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto thee as, as, as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole that very hour. What does that mean? It means that she had faith to believe, and she wasn't a, she wasn't a Jew. But somehow she had heard, we said faith cometh by hearing, she had heard that Jesus could heal and deliver people. Something stirred in her that she could reach to Jesus and she, he could heal her daughter, deliver her daughter. And through her faith, opposition comes. When you have faith for something, you're always going to have opposition. You're going to have struggles. She's rejected by the disciples, pushed away by Jesus, called her a dog. She said, yeah, but a crumb. Listen to what I'm going to say. A crumb from the table of the children of God will bring healing to my daughter. How much did she need? A crumb. A crumb. A small piece of bread, a crumb, falling from the table will heal my daughter. How much do you need? You need a whole loaf of bread? Do you need a mountain of faith to get anything done? I don't think so. I think we need to find that we can come to Jesus with just a little bit of faith. So there's, I believe this, there are stages to faith, and there's different kinds of faith. You say, Pastor, different kinds of faith. Yeah, different kinds of faith. So let me explain a couple of things. So what kind of faith do you have? Well, we got this little mustard seed dot here on your paper. And I want you to remember, and I, that's why I made these up to give to you, that you can look at this any time and say, really, that's all the amount of faith that Jesus said will move a mountain. But it's applied to the kingdom of God. Okay? So let's find out what kind of faith you have. Number one, we have faith for salvation. Do you believe that Jesus Christ saved you from your sins? Do you believe that? All right, come on. I believe it. I believe it. We have to have some tenacity about our salvation. Why? Because that starts your eternity. That starts your whole life. I believe April 11, 1976, Jesus Christ saved me Delivered me from my sins. I was born. I was born again, but I was born. That's when salvation started. Salvation was the work of Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection. The power of his blood. That changed everything. I believe in my salvation. I have living faith. Or the next one's living faith. Faith to live by. I believe Jesus Christ saved my soul, my life, so that I could live differently than ever before. Yeah. And I want to live differently. Amen. It's not just in words, although words are very powerful because they tell you what's really in somebody's heart. But I want to live differently than ever before. I don't want to be that same old Paul friend that was in the bars or running around or doing whatever. I don't want to be that. I want to be a different man. 
Every day, faith will do the work of God daily in my family, my work, and the church. Daily. It's a daily living faith. Go to the next scripture, our next saying. Faith by works. Now, I know that James said that we live by our faith has works in it, and I, I believe in that. But I, I want to say this to you, that faith has a work like, like this. By my works, things we do, everyday life, above the normal, above the just enough. Faith that is, in, that is expressed by your work and your ethics and your character and the words that you say. That's a work. I'm not the same as I was. You see, God is working in me and you to help me not to be lazy, not to be ineffective, but he wants me to be effective. He wants me to have a spirit of excellence in the way that I speak, the way that I I dress, where I take care of things. I remember a a man said this one time years ago. He said, if you don't take care of what you have, how can God give you something better? So he said, he said, I had, I had, he said, I was, I was saved. He said, I was doing music and traveling uh, music team. And he said, I had an old car, had holes in the floor, had all kinds of problems, you know. And God said, if you don't take care of what you have, I can never give you better. So you know what he started doing? He washed the car. He cleaned the car up. He put cover seats on it, seat covers on the car. He, he fixed the floor a little bit. It was still the same old car, but it was better. Do you know in a few months, God gave him a Lincoln? Big, bright, shiny Lincoln. Red one. My wife was jealous because she likes red. Anyway, and it wasn't, he was not looking for a car. He, he actually was looking for a car. He said, God, I, I don't, I can only afford so much. God gave him enough money to, he went to this place and the guy said, I got a car you might like. And he had maybe two or three thousand dollars to buy for this car. He got this Lincoln that only had like 60,000 miles on it at the time for $2,500. And, and God said, I told you I'll give you better if you take care of what you have. He said, God, so if I take care of this, what do you have planned? <laughs> he drove Lincolns for quite a while. But you take care of what you have. Don't complain about what you got. Take care of what you got. Mm-hmm. Fix it the best you get, you the best of your ability. But we have to live by, by that works in that. What's the next one we have up there? Faith provi- for provision. How many need things in your life? Maybe you need a job. That's a provision. Maybe you need, maybe you need food. Maybe you need some things. I have no idea what you need. But if we have to faith for provision to get through the difficult times. Because sometimes I need a provision just to get through the day, get through the week, knowing that I'm having obstacles. i got to have faith for that provision. That faith turns into trust. God, I trust you. I don't know how else this is going to work. I don't know how we're going to get through. It's like, it's like Israel going, leaving Egypt, and they get between the mountain and the rock, and the, Israel and the Red Sea. What are we going to do? We're gonna, everybody that has, doesn't have faith, we're going to die, your brothers out here to kill us. But Moses knew God had a plan. He just didn't know what it was. He said, okay, God, here we are. And you know, I think, I think this is so fantastic. That when Pharaoh and his army come up, the cloud that led them by night, you know, the fire, stood between Egypt and Israel I would say that's a sign God's making a way somehow. You know, there's a, it stops them right in their tracks. Because go forward. Where are we going to go? Raise your, raise your rod. I'll make a way through the ocean, through the sea, on dry ground. I mean, if you ever have water all of a sudden leave a lake, it's pretty muddy. It does not dry up instantly. But God brought a wind all night. And when in morning they cross on dry ground, when the Egyptians tried to do it, they drowned. Listen to me. 
in the provision that God make, will make for you in the days to come. When others try to follow your path, they'll never make it. When the enemy tries to follow the path you've taken, because of the choices you've made in God, the enemy will not be able to follow you. Hallelujah. So we have faith for the provision. What God does with it, how he does it, is his business, not yours and mine. Go to the next one. We need to have faith to see. Faith to see. When there's nothing else to see, what are we going to see? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You can put that up for me. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's a scripture you need to sit down and take apart and see what God has planned for you. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, so faith has hope. And the evidence of things not seen. I use this example for my wife. I was not living at home when she got saved. She asked God, what do I do? Do I leave my husband? What do you want me to do? And God gave her a scripture. If you will believe, Acts 16, 31, you and your house shall be saved. Amen. She said, okay, God, I believe it. And then the next day or two, she gave, he gave her a dream or a vision, I don't remember which it was, that she was in the middle of a storm, she was on a big rock, and me, I was out in the middle of the storm, the waves tossing me around, about to drown, and the hand came out of heaven and picked me up and put me on the rock. He said, that's my promise to you. And he did. God keeps his word. And what she had to do for the next year and a half, listen to what I'm going to say, is to believe, to trust, to have hope in that word that was written and the vision that was given. When it doesn't look like anything's going to happen, she could see salvation coming to the house. And somebody say, praise the Lord. We need to have faith to see beyond the circumstance, beyond what's natural around us. We need to have the faith that sees past those things. The next statement. Faith for healing. You know, we talk, about, we talk about general faith with a lot of things, but I think there's a pinpoint that God does for certain things. It's like the woman that had the, had the child or a woman that had the issue of blood. I need the healing. This is what I want. I'm not just shotgunning. I want just whatever. I want to have direct identity. This is what I need, healing. When Paul Jr., Pastor Paul Jr.'s wife got cancer, we're all praying for her. She had planned to have an operation. And on that Saturday before the operation on Monday, God said, I'm going to heal you. And so she called Paul in and said, I'm not going to have the operation. God said, he's going to heal me. Kind of broke his heart and going, what? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, our faith is tested. Our belief is tested, our belief system. It's on trial. And so she comes to church on Sunday and tells us that she's not going to get the operation. She believed God's going to heal her. I got upset. You see, because I had a plan for the operation. Yeah. Because we didn't, we didn't even ask God about certain things. Okay, let's take care of the lump and we'll take, you know, take care of business and whatever. And I got a little upset in myself and with God. And God said, I did not ask you to believe for her. I did not give you the faith for her healing. I want you to agree with her faith. There's a difference. Come to the place of agreeing, helping her with her faith. When, when they, they lowered the man down out of the roof, 
on the, on, down to where Jesus could heal the man? What did the scripture say? He saw their faith, not his faith. He saw their faith, and he answered their faith. We believe Jesus could heal our friend, and he saw their faith and healed him. He agreed with their faith. The Bible says, we're two agree is that touching any one thing, asking the Father, he will do it. I agreed with Paul and Kim and my wife. We agreed according to the faith that God has given her. Didn't have the operation. Nurse called her up and said, oh, you, you know, we did a test. You don't have any cancer. Uh, the operation was successful. Go ahead and get some chemo. And he said, I never had the operation. What do you mean never had the operation? Uh, I'll call you back. I'll check my records. Found out they didn't have the operation, and Paul carries a paper with him today that your wife is cancer-free without an operation. Now, I know that people go through operations. Praise God. I know people go through operations. Sometimes we got to have faith for that provision. But I also know that God heals if he's giving you the faith for the healing. But you cannot presume upon God. You ask God, what do you want me to believe for? And I believe that God just turns around and can supernaturally say, I want you to believe for this. I want you to receive this. This is what I have for you. I believe that it's, 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 that's possible. That's what God does. Does God see your faith in him for the things? Not presuming upon him, but believing, trusting, and listening to him. I've, I've run into a lot of people who just presume, well, God said if I pray this, it'll happen. That's not what the scripture says. That's presumption. That's, that's trying to get something that God didn't say. But if God says something, let's declare what God says, not what you feel. Let's find out. And if you've got to pray a little bit, go ahead, pray, and just ask God. God settle yourself down. There's times when I got frustrated and, and I wanted to do something or I felt like God should do it like this. And when I got no answer, I said, stop the music. Stop what you're doing. Settle down and say, God, I want your will. Please forgive me for presuming upon your will and your plans. What's your will? And then God does a whole different area that I thought he would do, but he came out with the results that he wanted. Isn't God good? I mean, he is so good to us. So good. The last one is faith for, uh, put the, faith for eternity. Do you have faith for the life after death? So many times we're, and I, I've talked to people on their deathbed, I talked to one sister. She loved God. 70 years she was saved, maybe a little more than that. She was in her 90s. And I went to see her. And she said, Pastor Paul, I, I just, I need to know. Am I going to heaven? You see, when we're faced with eternity, there comes doubt. There comes the voices that work in us. And we all have that. We all have doubt at different times. But she, she asked me, she said, am I going to heaven? And I said, to her, I said to her, sister, I said, here's all the things you've done in your life. But doing does not get you to heaven. Believing. Do you believe that Jesus Christ say, died for your sins? Yes. Do you, have you received Christ as your Savior? Yes. I said, that's all we need. Now we just need to trust him. For the days that we face, the end of our life, that we may live into eternity, go from this life into the next door and into eternity, walk into eternity. Two days later, she walked into eternity. But sometimes we need, sometimes our faith is challenged, not by us, but by things, stuff. This life challenges us because it's a different way of living. Even though we've done it for 60 or 70 years, we still face challenges. We still face those things that, that work against us. So my question to you is, what are you believing for? Do you have a need today? Do you have a desire today? What do you need? 
God's given you faith to believe that. That's why you, we, feel like we, we, we feel like God wants to do something. We're not sure what. And, but I believe that he's saying to you and to me, believe me today. Do you remember when Jairus came to Jesus and asked him to heal his daughter and he's walking through town and got interrupted by the woman that had the issue of blood and while he's standing there, a guy comes up from the house and said, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter died. Talk about ripping your faith apart, your heart apart. And what did Jesus do? He turned and said, only believe. So there comes a time in our life and situations come that our faith turns to believing. It's actively looking to God to take care of what I can't even see anymore, what I don't even know anymore. So when does your faith turn into believing? When everything else seems to go haywire, and yet you're going to trust God. You see, faith, believing, trust is all part of that whole situation. Do you trust God today with your life? with your living, with whatever you're facing, do you trust God? Now let me just say this to you. In the scriptures, in one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is a gift of faith. That's a supernatural faith. That is really not for most of us. We have to have a living faith. But a supernatural faith is given to a few people around the world that just have faith for certain things. Some people have a gift of healing. And they have to have faith for it. Some have the gift of doing things. Or, and even in business people, you have talents. But you also have to have faith for it and, and a gift of faith to believe that God is leading you in this way. And all of a sudden, because you do that, the doors open that you can enter into that, that business or that, that thing that God wants. That's special. But I want to deal with just everyday living right now. What do you believe God for? I want you to close your eyes right now just for a minute. What do you need today from the Lord? Do you need provision? Do you need healing? Do you need that living faith, that faith of works that every day we live above what we could have? We live, have faith to see, we have faith for eternity. You have faith. What we have to do is come to that place of planting that seed of faith in God and letting him have his way. Would you stand with me this morning? The Bible says to us, and I said we said this a minute ago, if two or three agree as touching any one thing. Asking the Father, he'll do it. I want you to have faith, but I want to agree with your faith. I want to agree with you. I want to encourage you that whatever you ask God for, he's able to do and will do in his timing, but we're going to trust him that he's going to fix it. How he's going to fix it, I don't know, but he's going to fix it. He's going to meet that need. He's going to meet that faith that you plan in him today. If you have something that you would like me to pray with you about, agree with you about, have some other people stand in agreement, if that's you, I want you to come up here today because I want to agree with you that God is able and will do what he says he would do. In Jesus' name.